Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Matthew Cobb, who has written a fascinating new history of the French Resistance, a subject which has strangely been neglected by historians in the Anglo-Saxon world for the last 25 years. Before the interview, Matthew told me how, when he was living in Paris, seeing images on TV of the city in wartime draped in swastikas had made him resolve to find out all he could about the lives of the Frenchmen and women who had stood up to the Nazis. Matthew takes up the story from the cataclysm that was the fall of France in June 1940. The fall of France was such a catastrophic event. And I think in, you know, in our minds, people think, oh, well, the French just kind of rolled over and died and you know, mm. played dead or gave in. Mm. Not at all. There was tremendous fights. The reason why it was such a terrible catastrophe was that France was the best armed, the most powerful, the most professional army in the world, everybody thought. Mm. And they were defeated very, very rapidly by, in six weeks by a combination of you know, brilliant German tactics, uh, which completely threw everybody, and also terrible misleadership at the top. So the French did fight in the war. It was very, very brief. About 100,000 French soldiers were killed in those six weeks. Absolutely mm. remarkable. But then when the government sued for peace, very, very quickly, there were signs that people were outraged and unhappy about this. I and mean, the most immediate sign was Charles de Gaulle, who was a, a very junior general. He'd only been made a general about three weeks earlier. And he escaped to the UK. And from London, he made a broadcast, which virtually nobody heard, saying that, um, you know, I'm basically, I am France, in a rather yes. kind of strange way. Mm. So he was the external symbol that something could be done, but he had absolutely no backing. He was unknown in France and so on. In terms of the people within France, which is really what my book concentrates on, from the outset, people on their own produced leaflets saying, you've got to carry on fighting, or they cut telephone wires, or they you know, refused to go along with the instructions from German soldiers or they threw out leaflets or, and were immediately terribly victimized by this. There was a, a, a Jewish man in Bordeaux who slapped a German soldier before the armistice was actually signed and he was taken out and shot the next day for it. People who cut telephone wires that the Nazis were using from their air bases, again, were just taken out and shot. So the occupation was extremely vicious in terms of trying to prevent any signs of unrest or act activity. In terms of a more, what we more really recognize as organized resistance, there were two things in, the, in, in 1940 that really showed what, what was going to happen. First was this very small inchoate group, which we now call the, the group from the Musée de l'Homme. The Musée mm. de l'Homme is the, uh, the anthropological museum, which is just opposite the Eiffel Tower. Mm. And a group of people who were based there, who were anthropologists and art historians and others, got together and started producing what was one of the first resistance newspapers, uh, which was called Resistance. And they basically, well, they didn't survive very long. They were very amateurish mm. in their methods. And within a few months, they were virtually all arrested. And uh, there was a show trial a year later, and they were all executed. So that showed the potential that there was for people doing two things. They were on the one hand producing a newspaper. They were also collecting information. And some of the information that they collected about submarine pens and a great big dry dock that was out on the Atlantic coast. That was information we know was used in later raids when the, the, the British made a very daring raid in, in 1942 and actually destroyed the dry dock and stopped the, the Bismarck from actually being used, in, uh, used in, the, in the Atlantic. So it was an extremely important group, both in terms of letting people know that there was a, an alternative to collaboration and accepting occupation, but also actually carrying out practical work which the Allies used. The other major event which really showed that there was something could happen was a near spontaneous demonstration of school students that took place on uh, Armistice Day, the 11th of November, mm. which was traditionally a very important day in the French calendar, the, the Germans banned all commemorations. And nonetheless, there was this demonstration of several thousand school students, which was brutally repressed by the Nazis. But that showed that there could not only be this kind of semi-clandestine form of resistance, but also more, more large scale demonstrations were possible. And throughout the occupation, there were a series of demonstrations, not in Paris, but in other uh, cities and 
big strike waves and so on that showed that there was a more large-scale mass popular form of resistance could exist as well. You mentioned de Gaulle a moment ago and he was based in London throughout the war as the leader of the Free French and it's very clear from your book that the resistance's relationship with de Gaulle and London was absolutely critical and I wondered if you could say something about that relationship because it was often it was often very um, strained. Well indeed the the image that comes, you know, most most of your listeners probably have is that, oh, well, the goal, you know, he created the resistance or, or something mm. like that. Not at all. He was extremely suspicious of anything to do with civilians with guns or civilians mm. at all. I mean, you know, he was a military man. His idea was to rally in his first 18th of June appeal, which is coming up to that would be the 69th anniversary of it, his radio broadcast on the 18th of June, was to free French soldiers. So to any French soldiers who were in Britain who'd been evacuated after Dunkirk or anybody in the empire, because you've got to remember France had this massive colonial empire in Africa mm. in particular, that they should join him and carry on fighting. So it was very much the honor of France that he wanted to maintain mm. on a military level. De Gaulle was absolutely against any kind of action or anything that was not under his control or anything that could lead to mass movements or anything like that. So the resistance inside France was continually pulled between, on the one hand, de Gaulle gradually became the figure of the resistance, the public face of it, through the BBC. Really, there's kind of a triangle going on. There's a triangle between the internal resistance, which was very fragmented in itself, was not at all united. De Gaulle and representing increasingly as the war went on, the Free French and therefore a potential future government. And then the Allies, who were Churchill admired de Gaulle, I think he saw in many ways a kind of a fellow, they were very similar in many ways, so he, he admired de Gaulle for his, for his determination and his courage and all the rest of it. And then later, after uh, December 1941, when the US entered the war, Roosevelt, who absolutely loathed and detested de Gaulle, hated him and was very suspicious, thought basically that he was a fascist in, in disguise and that mm. if he were to come to power, he'd be another dictator. And it's this triangle of, of forces were, is really what is the theme of the book about how the resistance within France had to relate to these these two forces who really had all the, the influence because all the money came from the Allies, the radio came from the Allies, and de Gaulle really was built up by the BBC 